Just a quick note before you listen to this episode of Football a la Turca. There were some technical difficulties in which uh, for the 90% of the podcast, unfortunately, my camera was picking up the noise instead of my uh, studio quality microphone. And you will be hearing background noises like my squeaky chair, stuff like that. Because usually whenever Umut or Jakub uh, are speaking, I mute my microphone and then I can do all sorts of disgusting things in the background like uh, clear my throat, uh, pick my nose, uh, you know, all the things that uh, that people do um, and, and, and squeak my chair, you know. And I was under the impression for the entire podcast that I was muted when people were talking. Until the very end when my kid entered the room and I told him very politely to be quiet. And suddenly I noticed Umut stopped talking and then I realized that there was something wrong. Um, anyway, long story short, for the majority of this episode, unfortunately, you will be hearing a lot of squeaky chair noises and me clearing my throat from time to time, maybe even coughing. It's uh, an insane amount of editing I would have to do to clear all of that up. In fact, the squeaky chair, I would not be able to filter out anyway. A cough or uh, clear my throat or something is something I can pick out. But then that would require me basically to re-listen to the entire episode, which is over an hour. Uh, and I just want to get this episode out to you as quick as possible. So be warned. This is not our usually usual high standard of uh, sound quality. I do apologize in advance, and I will assure you it will not happen again in the future. But um, yeah, unfortunately, for the majority of this episode, my camera is picking up my my sound instead of my microphone. So uh, first and foremost, my quality, my sound quality, will not be as good. And, of course, the background noises. So I do apologize for that, but I still hope you will enjoy this show. And for the upcoming episodes, uh, we will have a lot better sound quality. And, of course, this had to happen the week that Umu just uh, went out and bought a decent microphone. And, of course, I ruined it with this. But my apologies, and it will not happen again in the future. Thank you, and enjoy the show. This podcast is part of the Big Heads Media Podcast Network. Go to BigHeadsMedia.com for more great podcasts. Welcome back to Football on Turka. We're here with our part of the, of the season review for uh, the Turkish Super League, Turkish football in general. We'll also be looking in, um, at the promotional playoffs and the teams promoting from the second division. But let's uh, get back, right back into where we left off last time. Let's uh, give Umut an opportunity to talk a little bit about uh, Galatasaray's uh, season. But before we do that, of course, let me quickly introduce... Uh, my co-hosts here, Jakub Marofolo and Umut Nadiri, of course, and then myself, uh, Kam Bayezid. So, Umut, um, let's just get straight into it. Uh, we have a lot to cover still. Uh, let, let's uh, hear what you've got to say about uh, Gal's season. Yeah, like, it started pretty bad for Gal's, right? Because they had to start the season without their primary goalkeeper, Fernando Muslera. Like, he got injured. Uh, the previous season and couldn't be joining to the team uh, since the uh, halfway through the season so like uh, so I had to start with Fatih Öztürk and Okan Kochuk like Fatih playing 12 and Okan playing 11 games before uh, Musara came in uh, midway through the season so I believe like it was a pretty rough time for Gaz right uh, without being able to play with the proper keeper uh, I mean like you said like Arsene Destinolo uh, was the thing for Besiktas but like it was an unplanned thing for Galatasaray so 
I believe it was it, it made a quite a bit negative impact for the squad for the games because like we have witnessed some games that Musa would have saved if he were there. But like uh, Fatih or like Okan Kojuk uh, was less more exper- less experienced, so uh, couldn't be able to like uh, take the game uh, from the hands from the opponent. Uh, and I would like to say that Gauss Rice uh, team wasn't built up properly before the season as well. Like Gauss Rice started season without a proper uh, central midfielder as well. The only only player to play as a center mid was uh, Yunus Belhanda, uh, who wasn't uh, obviously really liked. By many of the Gauss Riot fans, uh, so he wasn't as supported. So <coughs> Fatih Terim had to uh, play a trick and like just hope uh, that Thailand Antalya would be uh, great in a role as a center defensive midfielder to like uh, hold up the position and build up the play from the back. Uh, it was kind of similar to how Luchescu uh, did with Ayhan Akman back in. 2002 when he came from Besiktas like he made a different player out of him and like how Thailand came as a center attacking midfielder from uh, Bükşehir Erzurumspor uh, he somehow converted into a defensive player uh, and he learned how to tackle or like he learned how to uh, use his vision uh, like building a play from the back uh, like uh, in the initial stages of the league, he, re- he really, really made a positive impact in the team. That because like the only player to play as a center defensive mid after Ryan Dong uh, was him. But like Ryan Dong, you know, he's getting older and he's getting really slower. So I think he couldn't handle that challenge uh, on the midfield uh, anymore because like he's uh, getting too sloppy uh, yeah. like old style of uh, center mid uh, like he'll be just uh, I think used as a center like uh, center back yeah. for the season and also Fatih had to convert a left midfielder uh, Emre Kulinch uh, came from Sivas uh, to a center mid so like he paired him up with uh, Unes Belhanda at the start of the season to play him like play them uh, as partners for uh-huh. the rest of the season and he also like uh, took uh, his old uh, player Arda Turan like you know he forgave forgave him uh, before the season like, and uh, signed with him but like it was plain obvious that he won't be like as consistent as his like uh, past self because like he's getting older uh, and like he's never like the you know dynamic player he's been on the decline for a few years already but you you can still see sometimes he still shows glimpses of uh, the player he once was Mm -hmm. yeah Uh, like even like uh, uh, sometimes uh, when he came in as a sub uh, like he made a difference uh, throughout the season like Mm -hmm. when you need that intelligence in the play like uh, in front of goal he like a player to be composed and like uh, plan straight uh, and like uh, like you know uh, how do you say it uh, like make it in front of goal uh, like present chances to his uh, teammates he was there but he wasn't quite enough though like yeah. so like midway through the season Galatasaray lacked uh, <coughs> a player to have that pace uh, so uh, like they bought on uh, again and like yeah again and he made a positive impact uh, this time as well but but mm-hmm. like just for a few games yeah and like Mustafa Mohammed was the another transfer came in uh, in January and who was the other one uh, another play came in uh, I forgot him right now I think um, it's Yedlin yeah ah yeah yeah, yeah. Yedlin Yedlin, Yedlin. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, uh, Omar came for, yeah, yeah, yeah Omar El Abdullah got injured from his eye in his uh, New Year celebration. Yeah. Uh, it's an unfortunate yeah. incident to his eye. 
So like it's really currently right now it's like a unknown like if he's going to be able to play for the next season. So like Gaza has to like uh, move away and But he was on loan, right? You guys uh, got him on loan, I think. Didn't you? I don't think so. Like uh, Omar came in as a transfer. Really? Oh, I thought it was just a loan. Yeah, like uh, Yedlin as well came as a transfer, not a loan. Hmm. Uh, so like, I think two two players uh, needed to be go, but I don't think like they are they have the you know tactical knowledge or the uh, technical aspect of the play, mm-hmm. uh, just like how Mariana did for God's or, or like how. Uh, Albert Riera presented uh, at his time for yeah, Galatas, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, like they are like for uh, they are like a different version of uh, <coughs> Martin Linnes, uh, for example. Like they are stamina kind of uh, endurance fullbacks, wing backs. Mm. Uh, so like they also Galatasaray, uh, you know, struggled to find a goal in the first half of that Yeni Malatya game because like the uh, whole formation was like uh, missing that kind of technical aspect uh, mm. on his wing backs uh, like both uh, Sarachi and uh, mm. uh, but what, was that? what I'm hearing then is that that Galstri just had a very uh, had a wrong transfer policy right like targeting the wrong profile players basically. yeah like I would say that like because uh, you can't like build up a team based on lone players and like the base of the team uh, consisting of lone players. You can. Uh, <laughs> no. Bishik, they have done it a few times. <laughs> yeah, like, but uh, in the wrong run, uh, it will just, it will just uh, have a bad effect the on pro- you. Like, the problem is that you, you, especially when these guys do well, like Mario Gomez, Talishka, uh, mm-hmm. now Gezal, Rosier, Abu Bakar. Abu Bakar was loaned initially too, yeah? So the, the problem with that is that you're getting players that you probably otherwise couldn't get, and they're of a very high caliber, but it's almost impossible to keep them. Like, you, yeah, like you get them for water. Yeah, like, it's a double-edged sword. Yeah. Like, uh, you, I don't know, like, one one of the... Uh, a few uh, differences is that Felipe Melo, that guy's right, mm-hmm. initially, like, loaned him three times i guess yeah something like that season, and then uh, took his uh uh transfer uh mm-hmm. like but that, that was know. a that was a unique situation where melo yeah. kind of burned his bridges in italy and yes. even though he did really well at galtzai like nobody really wanted to they didn't want to um you know burn their hands on him Mm-hmm. Again. Yeah, like in the situations like uh, Jetson Rodriguez, uh, Marcelo Saracci, uh, Halil Dervishoğlu, or Henio Yekuru cases, uh, <clears throat> if even if they like uh, succeed in Galatasaray, the host team won't be able to like give them to you uh, straight away. Like they mm. will demand a high value. Yeah. Uh, and if if they don't succeed, then you'll just. Uh, uh, miss out on him and won't pay it again but like mm-hmm. you'll be just wasting your uh, wage budget on a player that you won't be playing mm. a friend of mine uh, at the beginning of the season said the exact thing about Gazal basically he said this will only be worth it if he wins us the title and uh, of course at the time he didn't think that would would happen like neither did I uh, you know, but he he ended up doing it. So then you, then you can say, okay, you know what? Like, let's say Bishtej are unable to secure Gezal permanently, uh, then still they will have gotten a lot of money out of it. You know, Champions League money. Uh, yeah, like, but, and also like there are different cases that if you loan a youngster, you'll be just developing a player yeah. for a different team mm-hmm. that you won't be able to play anymore. Like That's how true. Jason Denaya. Uh, yeah. Played for Galatasaray. Right? Like we just uh, get away with like we just like developed a play for Manchester City mm-hmm. at the end. Yeah, yeah, that's like, true. That's true. Then he just went to Olympic Lyon. Yeah. Uh, and they got the money. We didn't. Yeah, 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 that's true. But of course, I mean, it's it is like you say, it's a double-edged sword. Like this is the position Turkish clubs are in right now, where we we can't really afford players like that like a jason denier who was rated as a really big talent when he was younger like those types of players don't come to turkey yeah 
you know so that's the only way you can maybe get hold of it and if you're lucky um you know you 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 get a situation where like a felipe mill situation where despite the fact that he's really good for some reason or another like nobody really wants to fork out the cash and you you manage to 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 get them um like mustafa mustafa mohammed for example i think is a is a good because i think you guys loaned him now didn't you initially with an option with an yeah. obligation to buy yes. yeah yes. and i think he's a really good um good example of of a loan that can work and then Bistach had that with uh, manuel uh, fernandez as well like they loaned him initially then uh-huh. bought him for two million or something like sometimes it can work out really beneficially but other times it's just a bridge that you're making like a, is, a temporary that fix how, that is how justin uh, fernandez incident happened as well uh, we mm-hmm. took him from benfica and like he played really well but he's going now like we have to <coughs> feel his spot right now yeah like we just developed a player for Benfica at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 you know if it ends up if those players end up playing a key role in 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 you winning the title or something like that, uh, and then it will be a, then it will be worth it because okay you lose out on the potential transfer fee of the player but you do win uh, the, the 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 money from the Champions League, the money from winning the title, stuff like that. So it is like you say, it's a little bit of a double edged sword. If if you end up with a with a with an army of mercenaries that are all alone and you don't win anything, and at the end of the day, like for the, the position Galatasaray are in in a, in a way now where they are going. I, I mean, I'm not 100 percent sure if you agree, but I think they're going to have to make a big shift in the team, like a lot of players will be going sarachi's loan is up i think um like you said get is, go- is leaving uh mm-hmm. and, and i think there's also like a need sarachi is leaving yeah onyekuru is leaving onyekuru yeah and yeah, and like the thing is that gasa now uh like right now after villarreal's europa league win like gasa have to play like three knockout stages before participating champions league and like having a team built up yeah like yeah. it's based into those lone players like and Right now, also the board is not elected yet, and everything yeah. is like in a deep ambiguity right now. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's even not sure yet if if Fatih Terim will continue. Yeah, like depending on who is elected, like he's uh, he is to continue with Terim or uh, get a different coach. And I think it's a real harsh path ahead of Gus, right? Like he, they will just like uh, enter the season in a really early part of the summer, uh-huh. like in June. Uh, mm-hmm. I have to play these hard games. Uh, the Champions League uh, entry games. Yeah. Uh, with a half team. Yeah. And they will be playing against, uh, I believe, uh, potentially PSV from Holland, uh, yeah, Sparta like... Prague, and one team that's eluding me right now. Celtic. Uh, Celtic? Ah, oh, yeah, right. So it's, it's a pretty tough. Uh, really tough. tough, tough. Yeah, it's a tough crop of, of clubs. I think. I'm not sure exactly what Sparta Prague's current status is, but, but PSV have a decent squad. Uh, Celtic have, of course, a decent squad, and I think they're, th- these clubs are, are a lot more... I don't think they're going to go through a, well a, a transition summer. No, but I think for Galtzar, it's kind of a changing of the guard as well. Like, they, they are kind of being forced now. Like, they, they come off of back-to-back title victories a couple of years ago, um, and, and a lot of these players, like Figuli, like Belhanda, um, mm-hmm. you know, they played a, a very important role in, in that success. Um, but now... Last season, of course, they they missed out on the title against Besiktas. Now this season against Besiktas on the you know on the final match day, um, and despite the fact that they got really close, like unless they would have won the Champions League, again. For, this is the problem with Turkish football right now, that the, the 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 big clubs are so dependent on Champions League money, and it's not just Turkish football because it's the same way in in, in England and in France and. In, in, in Germany and you know Italy, it's it's the same for all of them. Champions League is so so important for these clubs. The the difference is that in, in in those countries, at least you have four tickets. Like we have realistically one ticket, because the last time a Turkish club got through the qualifiers is more than a decade ago. It's like fourteen years ago. That's the last time a Turkish club got through the qualifying camp, uh, qualifiers for the Champions League. Mm-hmm. Besiktas got really close a couple of years ago against Arsenal, but uh, yeah, close but no cigar, and 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 like that's the thing. Like it, in Turkey, 
if your bishop touch Galtry or Fenerbahce with or Trabzonspor even like with the, the the depth that you have and the, the financial economy the, the the Turkish economy the instability there you know paired with the depth that they already have there's only really one option if especially if you invest heavily in your squad like Galtry did with with signing a guy like Falcao like Fenerbahce do like the, the the signings they made the last two seasons like missing out on the Champions League is so painful. Like, yeah, you know, if you're Besiktas, at least you can argue. Like, obviously they need the Champions League money as much as anyone, but they did not anticipate on the Champions League money. Like the, the even this summer, like they qualified for the Champions League because Trabzonspor got um, banned, so they qualified for the qualifying uh, qualifying rounds. But it was like you, you could clearly see, like as soon as Bistich played those ga- that game against Pauk, like they weren't prepared. It wasn't a priority. Like they knew going into those matches, this is this is not happening. Like we still have the squad to build. We have we, we barely signed any players. We have a lot of departures. It almost felt as if it was an exhibition game for them. Like, yeah, they, like uh, you had to play like Jermaine Lance as a right back. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right yeah, and it was over one leg as well, which made it even more difficult. Because I, which I really don't understand from UEFA. Like, okay, you make it one leg, but then at least make it being played in a neutral ground. Like, what that? Like, why did it, is it being played in Greece? You know, or vice versa. It's just not fair. Like, it's you're talking about so much money with the Champions League, and then you're basically giving away. The home I advantage think, and all that stuff. Yeah, I think like they pretty much screwed up on the decision part because like they, it was the like the earliest stages of the yeah. COVID cases. So yeah, like, plus it uh, doesn't matter for them, right? Because like Tottenham and Chelsea and blah blah blah, all the English clubs, the clubs they care about, they qualify directly anyway. They don't have to play qualifiers. So what do they yeah. care? Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a very tough situation now for Gals, right? Because they're in a similar situation as Besiktas was in in the summer, I think, where they're they are having a lot of players leaving. They will have to bring in, um, they will have to bring in a lot of new guys. They will have to build a squad because so so many fundamental play well fundamental like so many players that were filling key roles will will be departing. Um, and also, like you've been talking about you know, Emre Agbaba, for example, like you haven't been too happy with his performance, mm-hmm. and like and, and uh, Th- uh, yeah, Thailand had a good start to the season, but like I, I always feel, I always felt with Thailand that he is a good, good footballer, but he's not, like, he's not a special player. Like he's not gonna lift Galatasaray up to a higher level. And I think also in the second half of the season, we kind of saw his limitations a little bit. Yeah. Um, but what I like, I really liked Emre. Uh, Emre Kilinch at, at Sivas, I think we all liked Emre Kilinch a lot. And I thought he started really strong for Galatasaray. Right? He scored some important goals, gave some assists. What happened to him? He seemed yeah, to he completely fade away. He was given a away. different role than what he had in Sivas. Like, yeah, but that's uh, fine. But he was still performing early on. He was still being... I mean, he was one of the standouts early on in the season for Galatasaray. Yeah, but like, you know... Uh, Playing in Galatasaray has a higher duty, and like uh, playing in a different position has some qualities to adapt into. So, uh, he, yeah, but I even, think even at Sivas, he, he wasn't an outright winger. He played a bit of a free role there as well. Like yeah, the, yeah, like he. I think he ran less, uh, or like uh, he tackled less, or like he had to, uh, like I don't know. Uh, he had more players to uh, like cover up for him. In Sivasspor than uh, right now in Galatasaray because like as a player uh, to play a, as a center midfielder you have to like go ahead and like go back uh, every single like attack uh, you have to cover up for your mistakes you have to cover up for your uh, um, like uh, teammates I, I think he did that really well at at Sivas too but the, the advantage he had there is that he had Erdogan Yeshilyurt and Mertakan Yandash and they were all kind of doing it. Like, they were mm-hmm. interchangeable, so to speak, and they were, like, running through each other, switching positions constantly, and do, yeah, all, they were all working Sivas, hard. They have a dynamo like Hakan Arslan, who mm-hmm. is, a, like, a massive player to do that kind of thing. Yeah, and then Fatih Aksoy. 
Patrick, yeah. sorry. Those players has like a massive lungs, like they can't run yeah, yeah. for like. Yeah, they were playing two defensive midfielders, and then they were playing mm -hmm. three attacking midfielders that kind of changed position constantly. Uh -huh, and you're playing just with uh, Tyler and Tyler, uh, on your back, and who mm. I don't think like he's a runner or like a stamina player. He's just uh, like a holding midfielder, like how uh, Mark Noble is right now in West Ham. Mm -hmm. uh, like he just like uh, builds up attacks and like uh, cover up for initial mistakes and like he has learned to tackle I believe, mm -hmm. but never a stamina kind of player. Uh, for that, like Fatih uh, Tirim reached out to uh, Peter Atebo, I believe. Yeah. Uh, he also was learned from Stokes T uh, this season, but he was uh, really horrendous uh, throughout the season. Like I didn't like his performance, uh, and there was a, a statistic that. Uh, compared uh, his performance with Thailand's, like uh, they all, uh, you know, changed. Uh, I don't think they played as a partner, but like in a four-one-four-one formation, the uh, defensive midfielders were changed as like Peter Tabo and Thailand Thailand. And there's a statistic suggesting that uh, Galsai got 1.33 points overall when, whenever they started with. Peter Etebo, whereas they get like 2.16 point overall whenever they play with Thailand and Thailand, like uh, gives us a the massive difference uh, between the qualities of those players. Like Thailand uh, really had a positive impact on the team and the points. Yeah, but that, that can be very relative. Eh? Like which teams that Etebo start against, which teams that Thailand start against, you know, you have to take all yeah, that stuff like, into consideration. You, yeah, as well. but. Uh, the difference on these points uh, really suggests uh, there's a quite an impact. Hmm. Okay. Uh, and and also like uh, we can see that uh, whenever Etebo played, like he, he really didn't have those qualities to build up from the back uh, yeah. or like direct the team uh, into an attacking position uh, or lead it uh, mm -hmm. from the back. But uh, Thailand has a quite of a knowledge because he's coming from a central attacking midfield I, I think he is has a decent notion of where to stand uh, how, how to like build up the play how to use the ball mm -hmm. and he has a decent uh, vision of the ball uh, so he can see the runs or like chances coming but, but is Thailand maybe the Omer Bayram of this season a little bit where like I, I, I mean, like Omer Bayram, like was it la last season or the season before? He had like an am amazing period. Last season. Yeah, and everyone was kind of praising uh, him. And I think it's the reason that because like us, I didn't have any runners uh, in the, on those in that season. No, but I, I, what I'm Omer trying. Omer Bayram was the only one who has that, yeah, yeah. you know, but pace. Omer Bayram, when he went through that period where he had a ridiculous amount of assists and stuff like that, like everyone was. Like he was getting so much praise and like people were propping him up as a very high level player, which he isn't. He's, I, he was just decent on that team because he was only the chance creator of that team. Yeah, like, but I, I feel, also have most of his has came from those set pieces that he's mm -hmm. a great he's a great yeah, set piece yeah. team. I won't deny it. Yeah, he is. He is. I mean, he's all, he always has been. That's also why he's been successful at uh, Akisar and wherever. Yeah, and. Um, uh, but my point is kind of, he, I think he got, like, I think the the media and the fans kind of fooled themselves a little bit into this notion of this is really an exceptionally good player because he's going through a good period of form. And I kind of feel like it's the same with Thailand where he had an, a, a really good first half of the season. It was okay in the second half. He had a, an okay season overall. But do you really think that he is good enough to be Galtzrai's central midfielder? Like, I think the difference is that Thailand is uh, really much younger than Omar Bayram. Uh, and, like, uh, Omar not, Bayram Thailand is not that young. Eh? He's like 26 or something. Well, let me check. Yeah, anyway. he's, he's, he's a lot older than people think. Like, he's not 22. or Like, even Kerem, who I have to admit, like, I at the beginning of the season, I thought he was like 19 or 20 years old. He's like 23. Well, yeah, yeah, and Thailand is twenty five or twenty six, right? Yeah, Thailand is the same age as me. Uh, uh, he is twenty six uh, uh, right now. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I believe, uh, but yeah, I think Umar Bayram is twenty eight. Uh, 
20. You must be close to 30 by now, I think. Yeah, I yeah. I think so he's around like, my age. Yeah, I believe, like, he, Thailand, in case, uh, could be, uh, uh, like, uh, promising a little bit of more development uh, rather than Omar Bayram case. Uh, also, like, But do you Thailand, really think he's good enough? Like, does he live up to... The Celtic there are, Inans, the, some, the Felipe Melos, um, the, the, you know? No, 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 no. I won't even compare those. But, no, like, yeah. given an example that we can see that Celtic Inan was also uh, uh, couldn't hit, the uh, like, the highest uh, spot of his career uh, until he was, like, 26. Uh, like, he was uh, only playing yeah, for but, West Ham but, and Sport until Trabzonspor had him. Selçuk had something about him, though, and always had something. Like, he always had that vision, he always had that passing ability, those, those set pieces. Like, what sets Tylan apart from the rest? Like, what makes him special? He's uh, composed uh, in front of the defense, and, like, he has good vision. He can send good long balls, and he can use his both feet uh, in occasion. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Like, he... I don't... I saw his uh, long shots, but he doesn't, like, attempt uh, as much as uh, Salchuk did. Mm. Uh, so, he just, like, tries a few if he has a chance, but he doesn't force it so like it's pretty much it he can read the game well but he's not as physical but he has uh, better tackles than Salchuk ever had hmm. for me he he is the Jehun Gul Salam of this team like when what Jehun was at Trabzonspor that's what Thailand is for me like that level of a player good but nothing yeah. special and I don't think you can build a team around that like, yeah. Galtrai needs something else. Like, um, someone like Sali Uchan, for example. Like, if Fatih Terran would stay, I think Sali Uchan would be a great signing for Galtrai. Yeah, definitely. But I don't think, like, he'll select Galtrai afterwards because right now uh, he's been in talks with Besiktas but still uh, expecting a, an offer from Fenerbahce. He's uh, supposedly... Uh, Abdullah Afci phoned him recently. Did you hear about this, Yaku? I did not. I, I have heard um, that we wanted him, but uh, you know every every ex player that Abdullah Avja has or had has been getting called up. So it's <laughs> you don't really know what 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 to ex what to expect uh, in how true everything is. Supposedly, uh, Abdullah Avja has uh, has ca- has called Sali and promised him uh, a, a spot in the first eleven. Supposedly, yeah, you know Turkish uh, media. So uh, you who knows. Uh, I mean, for, for me, as long as he doesn't go to Fenerbahce, because if he does that, then he's just... It's going to be a... Uh, I mean, look, Fener fans, you have to be honest. Like, you are so crowded in the middle of the park. Like, he, any player... Like, if Sally, like, he had his the career he's had so far. He's finally back where he needs to be. And he's got this chance now. He's got a free transfer. He's got this chance. This is the transfer that will define his career. This next move in his career. If he goes back to Fenerbahce now to sit on the bench, which is in all likelihood what would happen to him with the likes of Irfan Jan there, then he's just committing career suicide. Like for him, going to Trabzonspor, going to Gal, if Galtzreich stay, keep Fatih Terim, like, or get in a really good coach like Okan or something then I could see that being a good option for him. Or going to Besiktas, where Sergen has, years ago already, made it very clear that he's a big fan of Sali's potential. That that would be the smart move for him. But going to Fenerbahce is like, that, that's just choosing for money. That's like the only way, the only reason to go to Fenerbahce is if you don't care about, about it. Like, in his case, and not in a general case, but in his, from his point of view, at this point in his career... He'd be naive to think that he's gonna play much. So, like, cause he's he's filling the same role as 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 Irfan is. You know, Ozan might be leaving, but you're not gonna play with Sali and Irfan Jan, right? Like, you need a defensive midfielder there, or 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 a box to box like Ozan. Anyway, right. Um, but so what I'm hearing from you, Umut, is basically that the squad building of Galatasaray has been really flawed. Uh, despite the fact that on paper they have a really good squad, um, do you 
who do you blame for this or who do you think is responsible for this is it the board is it Fatih Terim is it a little bit of both um, and, and how do you see what do you think they need to do now this summer um, to to build a squad that can compete for the, the, the title again because you know bases are going to get a big influx of money Fenerbahce are probably going to somehow pull a couple of rabbits out of their hat hat like they have been doing for two years uh, they're going to improve their squads probably. What is Galatasaray going to have to do to be com- competitive again? Well, I think it's both like the board and Fatih Terim's fault <clears throat> like in this current case. Uh, like I would say like Fatih Terim had major flaws building up a squad in pre-seasons that he started. Uh, uh, one of the reasons I believe uh, he succeeded in uh, his third uh, coming he, coming to Galatasaray uh, he wasn't the one to build the squad like it was the two door squad uh, that was like pretty much a, like uh, you know enduring with like uh, quality players like um, I don't know Badu Ndiaye Bafetim Bigomis uh, Yunus Belhanda Sofian Feguli uh, kind of players to build up a strong team uh, and like a team that be, that will be consistent uh, in the whole season uh, won't be like falling down uh, because of those injuries or stuff but uh, seeing that Fatih Terim uh, like both players like Marcelo Saracci who tends to be injured most of the season uh, Christian Luindama for example uh, is a player to mm, be injured. Uh, I I don't know. Emrak Baba, for example, I think he came in uh, after Fatih Terim's uh, confirmation. Uh, he's been has been through uh, pretty major injuries, uh, tough ones, and he has been a decline ever since. Uh, he was he isn't even like his old self, like how he was in Alanya in his prime years uh, and he's losing confidence he, he's trying to like uh, uh, pick up and like get to uh, his old self but I don't think it's uh, probable right now after like these kind of major injuries isn't this contract up as well like I think yes uh, yeah. I think he'll be like leaving yeah. that's right uh, after June yeah. uh, what can I say I don't know uh, and Figuli, Figuli is out as well, probably. How do you explain... Figuli was such an important player uh, in, in Galatasaray's last title in, in 2019. What happened to him? Like, last season, I felt like he kind of completely fell off the radar. And this season, he he played, like, up, almost no part at all. He has had a bit of injury issues, but, um, like, he's been completely absent, it feels like, for two seasons and I might be I remembering think, this I wrong, think but he's he's been same ever since he came. Like he he like seems absent uh, throughout the season, like missing like I don't know ten games, fifteen games. But he was uh, really imp- like in the 2018-19 season, he was really important in that final stretch of ten matches or so when 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 Galtier went up and over by Shakhtar, um, he was instrumental in that period. Yeah, he is instrumental and he is a big game player. Uh, and we won't be denying it, but he misses like too many games throughout the seasons he played. Like uh, it feels like he didn't play at all this season. Like did he? He did. But how, how many the games was did he longer play? than the usual one? I know, so, but like, it made a bigger impact than the usual. But like, how many? I mean, I, I feel like he he played absolutely no part in Galatasaray's season this year. Like, whereas, you know, in the past, he 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 definitely has moments. I cannot say anything towards it because like we doesn't we don't like see the training uh, of Galatasaray like how he, he performs during the training sessions, uh, or like how he behaves. Mm. Like he has a disrespectful behavior towards Fatih Terim or the other players. Uh, like uh, pushing Terim into this kind of dis- decision to put him ahead, uh, yeah. like mm. played played a little bit over a thousand, mi- like played uh, almost one thousand two hundred minutes. 
Yeah, like twenty-two due games. To not having a proper midfielder as well. Huh. Like he played as a center midfielder uh, most of the time in this season, uh, rather than his usual position of right midfielder or like how but, but, he plays as a uh, center attacking midfielder for uh, Algeria. Uh, Algeria, yeah. But do you think that's that's down to him maybe aging, slowing down, or just yeah, necessity? Yeah, I would I would hope for him to be like how Arda Turan is right now. Like he, they have similar attributes, like similar vision, similar game knowledge. But I don't think he is uh, like willing to perform <coughs> the Arda Turan because you know Arda Turan has a that motivation that he's playing for his own team yeah. uh, his sports but uh, i don't think uh Feguli has that kind of an aspect on his view uh, that yeah. he, he's just uh, like a player f- playing for any team uh, like uh, that would be like he's earning from him uh, uh, from the team and one last question uh before we, we we move on uh well actually i have two more but like about the team do you think uh if galtry did not part ways with Yunus Belhanda a couple of months ago. Do you think that would have made a difference for them? Do you think he could have helped them to win the title at the end? Yeah, like all the Belhanda haters would say like uh, that he wouldn't, but I would say like he is a vital uh, element in this team. Like uh, he is a player to like create chances uh, on those occasions where the uh, opponent team just closes down you and like uh, parks the bus mm-hmm. like he is the player to see the gaps uh, or like uh, play accordingly uh, against those defenses and he would be if he were to play in the uh, last Yeni Malatya game in this first half uh, that Galatasaray failed to like score a goal Mm-hmm. against those uh, because Yeni Malatya always to play uh, as a five at the back formation uh, with like uh, you know tower uh, defenders like Volus and Semikaya and uh, who was the other player I don't remember Adebe? yeah it could be mm-hmm. Adebe uh, so it, they were like just planted on the box uh uh, waiting for a Galatasaray attack I don't know what were their motivation like even the goalkeeper were like uh, was uh, wasting time even after like they were behind oh. uh, that w- that got me but what are you I, implying on what I'm not implying anything like, <laughs> he, he, he he willingly like wasted time like yeah. uh, and like spent time I, I think I think what their motivation was is very clear. They did not want to be the team that laid down and conceded five goals and gave Galtz no, right the title b- based on that. It was plain obvious that they weren't the one, but like... No, know, but if, if that would have... Buick is you, were scoring goal against Galatasaray. But if that would have happened, Umut, let's say Galtzray beat them 5-1 and win the title... It doesn't matter if something happened, like legit or not. You know, everyone would be saying that it would. Like just as how right now, Galatasaray fans are saying that uh, Hatay sold the game to Besiktas, the seven nil game. Like there's so many. If you look on Twitter, there's so many people saying, "Oh, you know, Bifong sold the match. This, this, that, and that." Like it doesn't matter if there's something there or not. Well, they will say anything, like because, yeah. like in that Zalat incident, it could be like a similar no, thing happened, you know, like how the Hatay game. Zalat, Zalat admitted to accepting bribes, huh? Years later, like not just in that match, by the way, like he has gone on the record saying that he took money. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, you can look it up. It's it's there to be. Also. Uh, the thing is that in the in that Malatya game that Gauss has suffered to find any chance to score a goal in that first half of the game, uh, the Balhanda kind of player uh, could be useful to break up that defense and like uh, make it possible to find an open chance because like Gauss's two backs were like really uncreative, uh, both like were spamming crosses uh, into the box with no reason because like there there were like two, uh, three defenders just uh, waiting to like uh, uh, head it headed away from the goal uh, yeah. 
But I want to say that uh, Halil Dervişoğlu and uh, Kerem Aktürkoğlu uh, made a really um, big impact on Galatasaray this season. Uh, that they were like really promising youngsters. Do you think Halil Even... is somebody that Galatasaray should invest in? Like, do you think it's somebody they should really try and, and buy? Yeah, I believe so. Uh, because like uh, seeing his also harmony with uh, Kerem Aktürkoğlu, like they were like two players uh, in the same head. Mm-hmm. Uh, they can find each other blindly on the pitch. Yeah, like yeah. If uh, it was to like uh, Kerem to uh, take the chance, he will find Halil Darvisholdo running to uh, behind, or like mm-hmm. vice versa. Like Halil is brilliant uh, on his vision. Like I, it reminds me of a younger uh, Dennis Burkamp, uh, not to like just uh, overrate him. Yeah, yeah. the type of player. Yeah, yeah type of player because. Uh, he is not as you know uh, as a forward. You he's a, he's, he's, he's from the Dutch strong. school, of he's course. Not you know. Pacey. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, let's let's one last question quickly uh, bef- because we have been talking about the outside for a very long time now. Um, do you do you think Fatih Terim should stay? Uh, depending on the uh, president election, uh, but uh, I would say like uh, Fatih Terim uh, has to like use his knowledge. And his experience on a bigger spot, like, uh, like I don't know, uh, being a part of the board or something like that, and like just has to leave his spot on the field uh, and the bench to a younger candidate like Okan Buruk. Or Do you think I- uh, Fatih Terim should be, for example, the sporting director or something, or even should become yeah. the president? Yeah, but uh, we are. Uh, you can have doubts about it because like Fatih wants to influence all the things around him and like being a sporting director like Fatih Terim uh, would affect the coach as well I think like he mm. would have too much influence on the coach like how Emre did on Errol Bulut before he came as a coach like it would be a too much pressure on the coach side of the team uh, we don't know it like no yeah. You can just assume it. All right. All right, let's move on then because uh, we've been uh, going for a while here. Um, let's talk about the promotions and the relegations of, uh, of of the Turkish Super League. So first and foremost, let's talk about the teams that are going down. So uh, Ankara Gücü, Denizli Spor, um, who were the other one against Sterberli, and then Erzurum Spor are the four teams that will be going down. <laughs> At least if uh, everything stays like that. We'll talk about that in a second. And then promoting to the Super League. First and foremost, uh, Adana Demirspor became the champions in the Birinji League. Um, they were uh, they finished on level points with both Gireshun Spor and Samsung Spor. But they had the three-way head-to-head in their favor. So uh, Adana Demirspor led by Samet Aibaba win direct promotion as the Birinji League champions. Giresun Spor go up as second place. And Samsung Spor had to play promotional qualifiers. And in those qualifiers, Samsung Spor lost against Altinordo over two games. They lost 1-0 in Izmir, missing a penalty in the 94th minute. Kukhan Karadinis could not convert from the spot. And then at home... It looked like they were going to win by 2-1, but they had to score a, a third goal. So they pushed everything up. The goalkeeper went up kind of to, to play the ball forward and got stuck in limbo a little bit. And uh, Ersin Destan, the 18-year-old new wonder kid, it seems like they have a new wonder kid every year, Altinordo, scored basically from the halfway line with a fantastic uh, shot. Uh, I mean, and that's one of those things, like, how often do you see the goalkeeper leaves his goal and somebody shoots from midfield and they can't get it in between the sticks? And this 18-year-old kid did that. And to me, that's that's already uh, a sign of, of, of talent there. Apart from that, he also scored 12 goals in the league uh, this past season. Big things in store for him. Maybe he can be that next Turkish striker um, to succeed Burak Yilmaz. Uh, let's cross our fingers there. Um, so Samson Spor went out there... And then Altai was in the other semifinals. They eliminated Istanbul Spor. Um, they beat Istanbul Spor in Izmir 3 to 2, and then they won in Istanbul as well, if I'm not mistaken. I forget the the score there. But uh, at the end of the day, Altai 
uh, led by Mustafa Denizli, went through to the final. So two Izmir teams in the final. That final was played yesterday. And in the 89th minute, Baichal scored the winner. Altai win 1-0 and are promoted to the Super League for the first time in 18 years since the 2002-2003 season. Altai are back in the Turkish top flight in the Super League. Thanks to Büyük Mustafa, Mustafa Denizli, of course, former uh, Turkish national team coach, coach of Galatasaray, coach of Fenerbahce, coach of Besiktas, uh, and of course, a legendary player for Altai in uh, in the 60s and 70s, I believe, uh, in which Altai actually had a really good period as well. They finished in the top three uh, twice in the Super League. They uh, finished third in uh, one of the first uh, in the first edition of the Milli Kuma, um in uh, 1956 1957 Altai are a team with great history um, the arguably the most successful team from Izmir and uh, yeah they're back uh, guys let's talk about these teams who are coming back the teams that are going down uh, Jakub you have barely said a word today let's start with you let's get your views on the teams that promote it and on the teams that are going down <laughs> Well, um, I don't, I don't really have a particular opinion about about any of them. To be honest, um, I'm happy that um, that Kiresun score is going up, but only because they are a fellow uh, Karadeniz team, and that's pretty much it. That's, a, that's that's also the the reason why I wanted Samsun score to go up so we can have more um, Karadeniz teams in, the, in in the Super League, also, even though they would probably play way too good against Trabzon Sport to prove themselves. But, um, you know, the this, this, this story about Adana Demir Sport is a, is a great one. Uh, I, I, I talked about it on Twitter, the whole history with uh, with their former president. Yeah, maybe Brooke. you should tell that story for our listeners, because not everyone is on Twitter all the time, of course. Yeah, well, the, 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 the gist of it is that uh, Adana Demir Sport just um, dropped from the Super League, like... Uh, I don't know how many years it was ago, but it was pretty pretty long ago, like 15 years ago or something. Uh, and, it was uh, a lot longer. It was like 25 years, I think. Cause, uh, they, oh, yeah. yeah. It's just the ti- the, <laughs> I'm getting too old. But, um, you know, back in 99, they were they were, they were were in the Uçuncilik, the Turkish 4th Division. And um, the club was just mismanaged uh, on, on, on all fronts. Uh, financially, the players weren't getting paid and uh, the, the results were awful. They just kept re- getting relegated and relegated. And um, they, tried, they tried pretty much everything. They had um, mayors of the city being uh, club presidents trying to force, you know, trying to push some money into the club. But uh, every time that happened, they just took the money and just, you know, lined their own pockets with it and left. And uh, Burak Chunar was a uh, was a guy that wasn't even from Adana. He, he was born in Yozgat, and uh, he had a he had a medical business. I don't know uh, I don't know uh, in particular what he exactly did, but um, he moved he moved to Adana, and he became a big fan of Adana Demirspor. And he was always in the stands with the with 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 the supporters and whatnot. And um, the supporters once asked for him to maybe consider being a being a um, being a president to the club, you know, because he's such a he's such a big fan of the club, and he has the money to, you know, maybe do some some good things about it, about the team. So um, he accepted. He he, he did it. Um, there was a legendary game against Livorno, with um, that the, that um, that the fans for years have wanted. Um, Adana Demir Spor is a club that was um, founded by members of the Turkish uh, state railways. So they were all workers and um, they had like a bond with Livorno because that team has also a lot of uh, a lot of um, fans that are the same way. So they have been asking for years now to play a game against them. And he, he, he arranged that. Uh, Livorno were playing in the Serie A at the moment and uh, <laughs> Adana Demis for where in the in the Uchunji League, so it was a pretty big thing. Um, he tried his best to you know fix the club, but it just you know it just didn't happen. He 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 he, he spent like all of his money to um, to fix the club's financial problems. It didn't work. He went to uh, the, the the rich in Adana. He went to the wealthy in Adana, and nobody you know turned an eye to him. Everybody everybody just said no, and the club 
was in such a horrible state that um, you know he he, he took uh, he took the debts of, of the club on his own on his own name and um, his, his presidency only lasted a year and after that year he uh, he was found uh, committed suicide um, next to his apartment um, it's it's tr it's it's a real tragedy tragedy you know because um, it was uh, it was supposed to be like a Hollywood story where everything you know the the guy that grew up being a fan of the team was also going to be the guy that saves the club from you know from folding because the financial problems were so big at the time but it just didn't and um, that story the first time I heard it was like uh, was maybe like seven years ago and every ever since I just you know remembered it and when Adana Demirspor were playing for the championship the only thing I could think about was that and um, I was following the match and it was you know they they, they won the game like 4-1 or something or 4-0 or something and it was great to see because like a week after they won they they went to his grave and they brought the championship uh, trophy to to his grave and um you know, it's 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 a sad story. Uh, a lot of people think of it in a in a good way, thinking about uh, oh, he gave, you know, he gave everything to his club, but he left behind a, a wife, a, a a child, and everything. So, yeah, it's not something to uh, to to be happy about or to be proud about. But you know, it's it's a footballing story that probably every Turkish supporter that that has heard of it will probably remember. <coughs> but. Um, yeah, the only only reason why I wanted Adana to go up was because of that. Um, Samson, uh, no, not Samson, Giresun, same. And uh, I didn't really care about Altai or uh, Altenor that say Altenor either. Um, I kind of don't like Altenor because they are a bit too high on their own uh, on their own farts, so to say, because they just keep talking about how they are not creating good, you know. Uh, great players but great uh, people and that their, their first objective is the great to create good people and not good footballers and i think that if they were to go up to the super league the whole the whole thing about them um, you know creating those good players will just you know disappear overnight because they will have tried everything to stay um, stay competitive in the league I don't know about that. I, I, I heard that uh, they uh, said something along the lines if we, if we promoted the Super League, we will take the money, but we will keep doing what we're doing, and we don't really care about whether we stay in or not. Uh, I don't believe that. Well, I, don't believe it. I, I think that uh, they have shown so far that they, they have a, a very specific philosophy, and I don't think they would change that because then they lose their identity, right? Like. The reason right now that Altinordo is such an attractive destination for young players is because they know they will get chances there, um, and and that's where the, the the young most of the the young hungry kids go right now, and that's the reason for their success. I, I think it would be I, I don't th I honestly don't think that they would stray from the path. I think they would stay the course. I mean, if you look if you look at the game that they played against Altai, mm -hmm. there was one guy that was 19 years old, mm -hmm. um, one guy that was 23. Um, uh, the two guys that were 23 and the rest of them were all above 26 you know so I don't know I don't know if you, if you look at their team they uh, you know 24 in Turkey is like really young mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like uh, in the prime of his life and they do have young players like Burak Incen and Izdestan and everything but I think that the moment that they will, would have gone to the Super League that they would have just you know just forgot about it but um, even skipping that, um, it's, it's great. You know, Altai is one of the uh, the legendary teams in Turkey. You know, it's it's more than 100 years old. Uh, another Izmir team. I I, I think that uh, you know it's going to be fun for uh, for Umut to see them. Um, even though I even though he's a Gustepe supporter, and um, same with Mustafa Denizli being uh, um, being back in the Super League is good. But I want to see how, how I don't know how you how, how you pronounce his name. Paishao. By child, um, yeah, yeah, I, he has been scoring like thirty goals a year. Yeah. for the last for the last three years. So I I, I wonder how he would do in the Super League. He's thirty six years mm -hmm. old, so he's a prime candidate to go to uh, uh, to go to Besiktas next year. Because <laughs> he's Portuguese. And, uh, Wagner loves. Uh, yeah, he is Portuguese. Yeah. yeah. So um, 
uh, uh, the most the, the 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 thing that I'm wondering the most is how we will do. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, he scored um, 29 goals in his first season in 33 games. Then uh, last season he scored 22 in 33 games, and this season he scored 22 again in 33 games. But then he also scored uh, three goals in the in the playoffs. So um, yeah, he's a he's a goal machine for for Altai. Uh, yeah, he has 105 games for Altai and 77 goals. Yeah. That is, you know, not a lot of players in Turkey will 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 will, will be able to do the same thing. Yeah, that's insane. Uh, Umut just uh, said uh, that my voice is uh, very loud or something. Is uh, do you hear that, Jakub? Is there a problem? Sorry. Is there a problem with my uh... some some stages like uh, huh. not right now, but like. Yeah, like Before. a bit ago, you sounded yeah. like you were trying to eat your mic. Oh, like this. Don't do it. Yeah, it's because I'm... Okay. My apologies. I was too close to the microphone, I suppose. Um, okay, well, uh, Umut, what do you think about the teams that got promoted? Are you uh, particularly excited about one of the teams? Yeah, like... Uh, because, like, they're, like, well-supported well teams. Like, they have, like, they fans behind them. And, like, they're, like, too, you know, uh, how would say loyal fans uh, so i believe it is uh, too fortunate to be seeing them in, uh, in the super league next year yeah like in fact that uh, my uh, first ever game uh, in the stadium to go like uh, it, when my childhood was a Gal- galatasaray altai game in izmir uh, atatürk olympic stadium oh. uh, in, yeah in like 2002 in, or 2003 two. yeah. yeah 2002 uh, uh, Alvar Balic and uh, I believe uh, Christian uh, scored for Galatasaray. Uh, the center forward came in from uh, PSG, I believe. Uh, bald guy? Yeah, uh, bald guy. Uh, and also uh, Altai's goal uh, came from Sinan Kalolo. Ah, uh, yeah. Who, who would yet rate, I believe. Went to uh, Besiktas after that, the season after. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So... Uh, there's a some kind of a memory from me uh, uh, going from to to my first ever game uh, as a kid. Uh, I think it, it, it's the first time Altai uh, got promoted to Super League after they uh, got relegated and yeah, uh, 18 in thousand eighteen years. Four. Uh, yeah. They got relegated in the, at the end of the two thousand two two thousand three season, I think. Oh. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, is also quite fortunate that they uh, made it with their uh, legendary uh, player or legendary coach mm. right now, Mustafa Denizli. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if they're gonna like continue with him because like yeah. how Gustafe did with Yilmaz Vural, but they then sacked him afterwards. They, <laughs> I yeah, th- I think it would. I, I I don't think Altai would ever do that. Uh, I think it would be more down to is Mustafa Denizli up at his yeah. age? Because how old is he? Like he must be like 72, 73 yeah. or something. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So at his age, like I remember ten years ago, tw- well twelve years ago, when he won the league with Besiktas, um, he was already on the fence of of staying on for another season. Like he didn't feel up for it anymore. Even then, like over a decade ago. So I was I was really surprised when he took over at Galatasaray couple of years ago and then uh now especially like that the fact that he um still took on a, a coaching job he was retired um but it's it's a very it's one of those romantic stories in football just like uh the story that uh that 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 Jakub's told earlier about Adana Demir which is romantic in its own way but also mm-hmm. has a very dark side to it this is a one of those great romantic stories in football where the the old fox comes back for one last uh one last ride and and and, and does it does the unthinkable promotes altai to to one last Super dance League. one last dance yeah and uh if i was him maybe i would just ride off into the sunset now i think this is a great way to cap off his coaching career uh, but you know maybe he has uh, enough left in the tank for another season in the super league um, we'll have to wait and see. I'm I'm personally very excited about both Altai and Adana Demirspor. I don't really have a special connection to Giresun or anything uh, like that. Um, but Adana Demirspor is a club I've always liked. It's it's always of course it's a it's a team as well uh, with a with a very um, left uh, background of of the supporters. Like uh, they have very uh, they have a kinship to the, the 
the majority of the Besiktas uh, uh, fans as well. There's a there's a relationship there, like there is between Ankaragücü and Bursaspor, you know, a little bit like uh, Kardeş Takımlar in a way. Um, so I'm happy to see Adana Demirspor come back. I'm happy to see a team from Adana back in period, but especially Adana Demirspor who are very well supported. Um, I just hope that uh, that there will be fans in the stadium this coming season, so that both the Altai and the Adana Demirspor fans can be there. Uh, one thing I am afraid of, though, because there's these things that have already been going around about Adana Demirspor. Like they're already their their president always said, oh, we've been in contact with uh, Mario Balotelli and stuff like that, and um, yeah, I, I, you know, with the history they have. The story that Jakob just told us, I think that would be an insult to his legacy, first and foremost, because you're putting the club in, in debt again by signing these types of players. Uh, and plus, I think you're putting an expiration date on the club, period, because you just you know you know how these stories go. You know, like, it, it doesn't end well. Like, a club like Adan and Demersport, with all due respect, they do not have the financial means to sign players like Mario Balotelli. They shouldn't even try. Like, just put together a good squad. Don't go for the big, uh, you know, headline signings. I don't know how you guys feel about that. I mean, have you seen those rumors, guys? Yeah. Mm, what can I say about the thing is that... Uh... It's uh, pretty much like a common habit, uh, a team uh, coming from a, a lower division to a, a Super League will pay uh, big amounts of money, uh, hoping that that will save them for the next season, mm. but like, end up being like bankrupt at the end of the season and like getting relocated once again and like just being like, uh, you know, devastated uh, by all yeah. financial means. Uh, I don't know, like, they have, like, uh, most of the teams have uh, hopes that, like, they will just sell shirts or, like, sell tickets to their matches by uh, yeah, but buying well, a good, but a, great... a Turkish team shirt is worth 10 euros an hour or something, like, uh, yeah. you know, you, so, can't, you can't make anything with that. Yeah, with the planning, that kind of planning, like, they will just, like, turn their uh, financial status into a negative uh, numbers mm. and I would say uh, on the Altai case as well the, the whole squad uh, ages yeah. around like uh, yeah. 30 yeah average yeah the Ibrahim Öztürk uh, who won the league title in 2010 with 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 Bursa Spor is, is is playing for Altai he must yeah. be like 39 years old or something yeah uh, and, and also they have uh, like Marcia Mossoro Yekta Kurtulush yeah yeah uh, Pai Chao, yeah. like we said, 36 years old as well. Uh-huh. And the thing Deniz with Ibra- yeah, Denis Kada, he scored. He, in fact, he scored. Uh, he scored a goal against Istanbul Spor. Mm-hmm. Um, and the thing is as well, like with Ibrahim Öztürk, for example, I remember, you know, the, the, a couple of years after Bursa won the title, he started showing these real, like, like these real clear signs of slowing down and and not being able to to, to play at that level anymore. I was really surprised to find out that he was still playing. And was actually playing in a side that were very close to getting promoted. Like, mm-hmm. um, yeah, that, that kind of surprised me a little bit. They also have like Chalar Birinci, who is an ex Galatasaray yeah, player, Rizvan Shimshek, yeah. who is an ex Besiktas player. Yeah. Uh, like all the team consists of those old uh, players who like uh, came from like all uh, big four, mm. uh, I believe. Some of them. Yeah, but like Chala Birinji made his career mainly in, in uh, for Denizli Spor Denizli. and such, yeah. and and uh, you know Yekta for Kasim Pasha, and you know these are all players that that I mean I I wouldn't really associate them with uh, with the big clubs. Yes, they had a stint there, but it's more like um, like how uh, what's that guy called that you guys got uh, last season with the the striker from Akisar. Um, Celik, uh, Celik, 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 something. Oh, I don't remember the, that. The attacker from Akisar. Ah, Mudat. 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 Yeah, that, like I, he played for Galatasaray, but like he won't. Like that's not that's not what we yeah. associate him with, right? Like he's the Akisar yeah. player. Um, also, Alta has like uh, Murat Akja, who is from Galatasaray Academy. Like he mm-hmm. was uh, like promising uh, a lot at his time, but like turned out to be a pretty average uh, defender. As happens uh, very often, but I mean, like yeah. you know, if you can come out of one of the big four academies, 
and you can still have a career in the Birinji League or the Super League, like, for me, that's not a failure. Obviously, for those clubs, it's a failure that, that you couldn't become, like, a main fixture in their squad, or, like, even as Nijip, like, a, a player that not necessarily is a starter, but a very useful utility player or whatever. But, like, at least like these players still have a good career. Like, it's not because you come out of the Galtzrai Academy and don't make it at Galtzrai that you still can be successful. You know, they still, like... They are still earning their bread, so to speak, with football, and that's that's the most important thing for those players. Um, now let's let's move over to the teams that got relegated, and in particular, Denizli Spor and Erzurum Spor, who issued statements over the last couple of days, and they feel like they should not and get relegated. Also, last night, Genshter Bili also made a statement in the same thing. Uh, but the fans, the, the Genshterberly fans, said uh, they they want they they don't. They oppose that yeah. kind of an yeah. ideology. Yeah, 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 yeah. So very very nice from the Genshterberly fans. But what do you guys think of these clubs um, basically trying to get out of relegating a second year in a row? Because Erzurum Spor relegated last season as well. Um, uh, who who were the relegations last season? Um, Erzurum Spor. Kaiser, yeah. So they escaped this season. Who was the mm-hmm. third team last season? Was it also Denizli? Uh, I, uh, I don't know. It uh, was Yeni Malatya Spor, Kayseri Spor, and Ankara Yücü. Yeah, Ankara Yücü. Yeah, Ankara Yücü. Yeah, Ankara Yücü. Ah, okay. Not Erzurum? I'm sorry? Not Erzurum? No. I thought Erzurum relegated last season, because I remember... Vivid... I'm pretty sure Erzurum promoted. <laughs> oh. Was yeah, that two okay. years ago already that they went down? Because I remember... Uh, yeah. I remember... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was yeah two when years they had Eggman. They... Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Well, okay, all right, fair enough. Regardless, what do you guys think of this mindset of these clubs that they should not get relegated and the argument that they are making that they invested uh, into the squad not anticipating that they wouldn't have income from fans and stuff like that? What, what do you guys, uh, what's your guys' takes to, on that? Uh, Jakub, let's start with you. Well, I think it's absolutely hilarious. Um, I know, I know that some some people think that um, you know uh, the the TFF um, abolishing uh, relegation last year, you know, uh, canceling it for last year. Yeah. That that was uh, you know stupid too. Yeah. I kind of disagree. I I think that even though the league was played pretty much, uh, there were only like seven games left from from my memory. That. Um, you know, I kind can understand how, uh, you know, how COVID can, um, you know, how how it could have affected the teams. So but look I, in I, look in Holland. Uh, what did they do? They they de- declared a champion. They stopped the league. Did they relegate teams? I think they they, did, right? they didn't declare a champion. They just stopped the league. Didn't Ajax get the title? No, they were they were first, but they didn't get the title. They just get they just got the European spot. Ah, okay. From as as far as I remember, I did. It's a year ago, but it feels like it was a decade ago. <laughs> but um, you know, I can understand that. But to 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 be horrible this year, even though you know that um, COVID wasn't going to be, um, you know, uh, going to disappear overnight, mm. and that the uh, the financial uh, hardships will remain the same. Um, you know, with fans not being able to go to the stadiums, and the TV money has gone down has gone down because of issues with being sports. Mm-hmm. To then go and you know be a Danish sport that won like six games, and then to complain about yeah, but we made our uh, financial decisions, uh, you know, thinking that COVID would have been over. So, you know, it's not our fault that we that we were relegated. It just doesn't make sense. And then, and then to use, um, you know, use the sympathy card. I don't know. Uh, I think it was uh, Genstebeli who said like yeah, but uh, the teams have like a combined. Um, 10 million fans and uh, you know you can't break their heart they uh, they should have been uh, you know they they should be uh, I think um, Denizli said that but I'm not sure it's just a, you know whatever yeah it was Denizli but it doesn't make sense you know you 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 saw what was going to happen you had ample time to uh, to change um, your your your, uh, your financial dishes, decisions your transfers everything um, to compensate for the lack of uh, lack of money coming in or the lack of uh, fans uh, bringing money in, mm-hmm. and then to lose and be a crybaby about it. Come on, man! It just doesn't make sense. Why? If we if we are going to do that, why not just 
you know, no relegations. Close uh, the league, yeah. Yeah, just have a league with like 60 teams and um, <laughs> just, just let them battle it out. You know? yeah, 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 It doesn't matter. Yeah. Like, play every two ga- play, play every two days or something. Let them play every day, huh? Yeah, play every day. Why not? It's not me that that's going to run like ninety minutes. Just play, like, yeah. play every day. Every team uh, have a sixty-man squad, of course, so they can change things up uh, to accommodate uh, the fixture schedule. And uh, yeah, I mean, or have like one one player per team, and then have them all be uh, like in a forest, Hunger Games style, and the one that comes out alive, <laughs> that, that one is the champion. Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, I, I put my money on Nkudu. <laughs> 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 anyway, uh, yeah, um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's it's a little uh, little silly. Umut, what do you think? Do you think these what? teams uh, should stay in the league or? Uh... No way, no way. It's like shamelessly uh, offered uh, that way. I don't know, like what they think. Like, but maybe like the the thing happened last year uh, made them uh, into thinking like uh, they will happen. It will be happening uh, twice in a row but no and why i don't know why uh, our uh, tff uh, did something like that last year i don't know yeah. why yeah. because like uh, none of the other leagues in the whole europe uh, did anything like that like none of the mm-hmm. leagues that finished you know like the leagues that stopped they 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 did yeah they, they just postponed it hmm. like, yeah exactly like the, the league I, I i know jakub said that he understands it i can see the point of view but l- there's there's no real excuse like last season they didn't miss all the ticket sales all the season ticket sales all that they got all of that they should have the, the league was finished a champion was declared so there should be relegation like i see where you're coming from Jakub, but at the end of the day they made the decision to continue the league they should have just stopped it, declared Trabs on Sport champions, and be done with it. You know? <laughs> yeah, and as yeah, for like, been cool. <laughs> yeah, as for that Dennis the Sport case, like they didn't even uh, manage to win their last thirteen games in a row. Mm-hmm. Like, and plus, plus, like, like Erzurum and Dennis the Sport both, uh, especially Erzurum, let a load of players go. They played like the last. Who did the, did Erzurum play against Fenerbahce, I think, or something? Like they played with with uh, with half their team gone, like th- that's having an impact on on the title race, you know. Yeah. And and that's that's in Dutch you ca- you would call that competitieverwalsing, because it is. Like you, like two weeks earlier you play with at full strength against Team A, and then three weeks later like half your team has been de- departed because you ha- you know you can't pay them or whatever. Uh, and you play with, with with a B team against uh, team team X, like uh, that's not like if that happens, like it happened in Belgium for example, where uh, like 20 years ago Kavi Mechelen went went but broke, and all the matches they had earlier in the season they got scrapped. Everything everyone got three points for the for, for uh, six points for the matches against Mechelen that season. So if you lost earlier on in the season against them. You were lucky you got three free points. But the point is that um, they just completely got scrapped. So that's what it should have happened with Erzum. Look, if you if you don't if you can't pay your pay- players and you have to let half your squad go like five, six games from the end of the season, then you should just get scrapped. Because clearly you didn't you're not you're you you know, you did did not you're not capable also, of, of sustaining also- yourself. Yeah, and also like Arizona Sport like spent too much on players like uh, even though like they are like on loan or like they're just buying their uh, players like uh, I don't know they paid for uh, uh, Atif Sheishu or mm-hmm. uh, I don't know Mustafa El Kabir, uh, Novikovas, Fabian Farnol, Manuel da Costa, Leo yeah. yeah, like they they made too much too many transfers in a single transfer season. Uh, I don't know. Like, I mean, it's what panic, were they right? thinking? This that that uh, happens all the time. Like, Anker and have been doing that for years now, right? Yeah. But but I mean, um, at the end of the day, there's relegation. You know that going in. Like, yeah. If if you do, they if this is their their standpoint, they should have made this six months ago. They could have made this case, or they could have said it at the beginning of the season. 
But this is it's too late now. Sorry, the the game has been played. This is just whining over some kind of a loss. Like the, uh, yeah. you you have to make your planning ahead. This is like going to the casino, playing blackjack, losing your house, and then crying afterwards and and asking for your house back. It's not yeah. how it works. You know, if you and also like even if the demand is like taken uh, into account, like if no not no team uh, gets relocated this season and the league is like what, uh, 24 teams. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, think about it. Yeah. That case, they will they will be the ones that will suffer from that kind of a, a, a case because like uh, then the league will, will have. A really tough fixture. Like uh, every week, we'll yeah. have like three games in a row, and, and we'll and have to relegate like six teams at the end of the season or something. And, yeah, and but do no, they... I don't. I don't uh, say it. Like I will say that uh, even the team will have like 24 teams, and the, the fixture will be like really tight and uh, like three games in a row. It, it will be like uh, the ones like uh, Arsenal Sport or like Denis Sport uh, will be the ones that suffer from it because mm-hmm. their rotation is pretty weak and like they won't have like any players to like play with uh, in a quality like football yeah and so many of their players have already left now because they can't yeah. pay them like what are they gonna do to build a squad for next season then like yeah like uh, they're gonna have the exact it, same problem again yeah it's just it's just putting a band-aid on 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 a double uh double broken leg you know yeah, where the bone is sticking that, out Beyond that, the teams coming from the uh, lower division right now, Altai, uh, uh, Adana Demirspor, and who was the other yes, one? Yes, yeah. Giresun Sport are far more better teams than uh, right now how uh, Arzurum and Denizspor are. Hmm. Like, uh, and joining them to the uh, Super League, they will also have to compete with the teams that are uh, better than them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, like, they will eventually get relegated again like they will just yeah. whine again if yeah. this is granted yeah i agree i mean and it, it sets us I, I i think the problem is that they already set a dangerous precedent last season by after the season was over suddenly deciding nobody is relegating and with that they created this and now i think the tff needs to step in and they need to be very clear and they need to say look sorry we understand your hardship like i don't they can give them a financial compensation like they have in the premier league there's a parachute system for teams that relegate i am wholeheartedly in favor for that but you cannot scrap the 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 the, the relegation the promotion and relegation because then there's no there's no stakes for the teams at the bottom of the table anymore next season we go into the last four weeks Galatasaray, Fenerbahce, Besiktas, Trabzonspor are playing for the title. Kayseri Spor are in 18th place. And they don't care anymore because there's no relegation anyway. Why should they try? You know? Like, that. that's... that's there needs to be this. There needs to be an incentive for teams... I can, I can, I can get what happened last year. Like, it was a pretty unprecedented case that COVID will uh, arise and, like, really affect on the whole world like globally uh, but you know and also like there was the fact that uh, TFF were like uh, thinking about like increasing the team in the league like into 20 teams uh, to compete in Super League because like we have to have like tight schedules like how the European leagues have mm. so like we have to play continuously to uh, to try to reach to their level uh, even like I don't know we I, I don't see we uh, us uh, reaching that level, but at least we can try. Uh, and I see this is as a, a good option uh, for that trial. But uh, right now, this shouldn't even be asked or like offered to TFF. Like it's like too shameless to ask. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. It's. Um, I just hope that they don't uh, cave again. Like a cave. I mean, there was political pressure last year to do it, to make that decision. It was a political decision at the end of the day. Um, and and you guys know that I hate I hate it when when politics get their noses involved in in football, uh, especially when it is like for example, I have to I have to talk about this really quickly. Did you guys see the news that 37 Fenerbahce fans got um, 
got uh, convicted in, tri in trial for um, for Shinel Gunesh putting some uh, red water on his head. Did you guys see that? I did not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. no. So do you do you remember when Shinel Gunesh uh, put some makeup on his head and 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 and, and faked a scar on, on the top of his head and and faked staples? Oh yeah, that that stuff. Oh, yeah. Do you remember yeah. that? Yeah, Th yeah, yeah, yeah. Thirty-seven Fenerbahce fans got convicted for that yesterday. By the way, um, they're going to prison. Um, do you, yeah, like, very curious, right? Like, um, how that match, match uh, was uh, not suspended, as the rule book says, uh, because... Uh, well, it wasn't suspended off. when Gaza came to Kadikar and Eric Gers got his eyebrow shattered uh, by some uh, object. But did, that, did, did, did they stop the match? No. Ah, exactly. If you stop the match due to fan violence, the rule book states, rule 18 or rule 19 of the rule book states... That the match will be abandoned and will result in a 3 uh, uh, uh forfeit. That's the that, that's the rules. That. That's the rules. And uh, yeah, Erdogan uh, and Bacheli got involved, and uh, suddenly the rules didn't matter anymore. And that's you know, politics in Turkey stick their nose and have their hand in every single cookie jar. Uh, anyway, let's uh, move. Rem reminder. This happened in 2007. Trabzonspor was winning 1-0 against Sivaspor. And then, like, the 92nd minute or something, a fan got into the into the pitch. Mm. And they abandoned the game. And Sivaspor won the game 3-0 uh, by decision of the TFF. So, you know, it has been, like, 14 years. I'm not I'm not salty about it, but I'm still mad about it. I mean, it. I would be salty if, uh, if, if you then see uh, what happened a couple of years later uh, in that cup game and, and Fenerbahce actually ended up getting the forfeit victory. That, yeah, like... but I wanted to say, um, I think that with the TFF not talking uh, or not responding yeah. to any of the teams that have been, uh, that have been asking for relegation to be suspended yeah. kind of means that they will... That it looks like they will accept it, or at least because, are considering uh, it. I'm sorry. At least they are considering it. That like otherwise they would come out straight away and say no, sorry. Yeah, exactly. No that's, that's what I'm thinking. I hope yeah. I'm wrong. Yeah. But uh, I don't think I'm wrong. I mean, if 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 they do end up accepting this ridiculous plea, then the format of the league has to change next season, right? Like we can't. Can we really do four, 24 teams? Uh, so. Every team plays 23 other teams, home and away. 40, yeah, why not? 46, so, you know, in, 46 plus the fixtures. Cup, yeah, yeah. Plus European games. Yeah. Um, and, you know, injuries are a thing that you can just turn off, so it's no, it's no big yeah, issue. Yeah, it's, uh, it's good that we have that mo that game mode, right? Like, we can yeah, just turn yeah. injuries off, turn fatigue off, you know? Yeah, it would it, be great. Then it's, uh, Atiba, Atiba will be playing until he's, like, 65. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, uh, Atiba, when he's 65, and, uh, and Ersin Destanolo is the coach. You know? Yeah, I can see it happening. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah, the format changed, and I think we would have to go back to the first format the Turkish league had in in its infancy, uh, where we had a, a Kırmızı and a Beyaz group, two groups. Back then, it was eight teams in each group. Now it would have to be twelve teams in each group. Then uh, you would just have to have those teams play home and away against each other. And the top two teams of each group go to a championship group playoff. And uh, you just decide the champion among those teams then. Like, that's the only option, I think, that you can really realistically have. Uh, you put, you know, uh, Besiktas and Trabzon in one group and Fenerbahce and Galatasaray in the other group. Let them uh, fight uh, among, each, among each other. You know, they're the biggest teams, right? Um, no, but it's... Uh, it's a uh, it's a mess if they decide to do something like this. Um, yeah, I, let's let's just all hope it doesn't happen. Finally, to close out the show, I really quickly want to talk to you guys a little bit about uh, the national team. Really quickly uh, about the thirty man squad that Channel Gunesh called up. There's four players that will still have to drop out of the team. Um, does anyone, either of you, have the team in front of you right now? All of the call ups. No, let me let me get it. Yeah, yeah, um, let me get it as well. I, I posted it earlier, by the way, but I, we I, you don't necessarily need it, I suppose. Um, but uh, yeah, let's just quickly talk about that before we close it off, and then I think uh, in our next episode we will do a, a preview of the Euros. We still have a little bit of time before the Euros start, anyway. 
Uh, and then once once the Euros get going, maybe we can do uh, a little bit more, like a shorter an uh, episode after every game or something like that. If you guys are up for it, uh, but let's sure. let's uh, let's be. let's talk about uh, the the selection quickly. So Turkey will be taking twenty six players to the Euros. Obviously, four players will still have to be dropped. Uh, Umut, which play which four players do you think are the logical choices for Shenol Gunish to leave at home? Well. Uh... Like I said last week, I would say like it would be a really tough challenge for Halil uh, Akbunar from Göztepe. Uh, and I don't think he will be a fit for a team like uh, Militakum right now. Uh, so I believe he will be the one to be uh, dropping right now. Uh, and also, uh, I think uh, Mahmoud Tekdemir from Başakşehir uh, is an old uh, selection from uh, and I don't believe he uh, put up a decent performance uh, in this previous year so like uh, us having uh, players like Dorukan uh, in uh, Thailand on Thailand, uh, on his position right now yeah would mean that he will be a drop in as well oh. uh, I don't know uh, who the other two would be though. Like uh, it was a like goalkeeper. Two... You have to drop a goalkeeper, right? You can't take four goalkeepers. Yeah, uh, Gökhan Akkan would be dropping, of course. Mm. And I don't know about the fourth one though. Like uh, it would be too controversial. Mm. This, I mean, that's the that's the job, right? That's a tough decision. Make make one, make one. You're the you're the coach. Who do you leave? You're the on? coach. Mm. You have to make the tough decisions, Ewan. Uh, I would be dropping Thailand and Thailand, but like uh, if I were to drop Thailand and Thailand, I would definitely call Berat from Trabzonspor. Mm. But uh, in this case, I think Thailand uh, was like brought up uh, as a player on that defensive midfielder. But yeah, yeah. Who do we have then? We have Okai that we have in defensive midfield. If if Mahmoud and mm-hmm. Thailand are left home, who who else do we have defensively? Ozan, Okai. Dorukan and Dorukan. That's three. Uh, so. Do you believe that uh, Orkun Kökçü? I would. Uh, I would always take Orkun. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I would not be surprised if Chanel drops him because Chanel is a racist. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. That's a joke. That's a joke. No, I, I would not be surprised to see Chanel drop him. I don't know how good Orkun's uh, Turkish is and all that. I don't know how how well he fits into the team. Um, I think his Turkish is really probably really good. I think you know you know, but I don't know. I mean, he was sure. born and raised in the Netherlands, so it should be okay. Yeah, yeah. Just like Halil Darvish, Yeah, but yeah. Or- Orkan is a really good player. Like he's a uh, he's a really big talent. Like I would it would be a shame if he wasn't taken. But but yeah, I don't think there is a way to to not pick Orkan to be honest. Because he has been doing so well for fi- uh, for Feyenoord at the moment. Yeah, um, yeah but so so as so, so as Berat, so as Sali, they've all had great yeah, seasons, you know. That that that's a whole, whole that's a whole another discussion. Yeah, where, like why, why Sali is not selected at the first case. Mm. I, it's it's a tough position. I think it, was, uh, I think it is uh, to do with his injury. Eh, don't think so. Be? Don't think so. Sali even no. made a statement about that, right? Didn't he? Didn't he say like I'm perfectly fine? Maybe it would be like Abdul Kadir Amur uh, dropping because like he didn't perform enough uh, so, in the league. Maybe. Uh, and he's just coming from a really tough injury. Like he don't want, but, he doesn't want to risk him. Yeah, but again, I think you'll keep him. I because, would. I would uh, too, yeah. Because Abdul Kadir is a player that can do, um, you know, you, that can that you can rely on to do something when he's, uh, yeah, how can I say it? When he's stuck, you know, mm. he's one that doesn't need any options. He can he can produce something by himself, you know. So maybe he'll go. If it was my decision, I would probably. I I was surprised that he even called him up, to be honest. But uh, I think that we'll keep him. And do you think it would be Efejan Karaja to be dropped fourth? Yeah, I think that. I I I think Efejan was he was he had a you know he's a he's a good player had a had a decent season, but I don't think he was as good as he was the previous years. Like he. Uh, he's I, getting old as well. I would drop Efejan over Halil Agbunar. Like yeah, Halil... they are different kind of players. Yeah, yeah, they like are, how, of course. Uh... But I think Halil is more useful 
honestly, like at the Euros against a team like like Italy, I think Halil could be really useful. I think when you're playing against stronger opposition, uh, Halil is too much uh, one-footed. I believe like he doesn't like to use his right foot on occasions uh, that force him to. But like, he's he, a, he's a great counter-attacker though. Aha, uh-huh, yeah, but like uh, as a. Uh, Uh, being a big team, uh, if you need to like uh, retain your possession of the ball, uh, you will need like a player uh, kind of like Efejan Karaja. But are we a big team? I don't know. Like ah. it depends on how Shenel Güneş wants to play uh, in the tournament. Hmm. Like he was, he is to decide an ideology and a philosophy of a game. Like he. He wants to like lead the game, or like he will just. Do you like, do you realistically think Efe Jankaraji will get minutes? No, but he will be like a, a having that all that ex, all those experience he has. Like he will be a, a quality sub. But if you're not gonna use him, then why take him? Right? Like you have Kerem Aktuvkolo, you have Halil Dervisholo, you have younger. No, Efe Jankaraji is like a number ten or like a, a right midfielder. He's a right but winger. Like a, it's, it's not yeah, 10. yeah, but not that proper right winger like how uh, you know Feguli is but does he even want to play with that like normally speaking he would put Cengiz there that's not even the system he'd be playing like Shannon always likes to play with uh, with an inside forward really you know yeah uh, so who's your fourth drop off Cut the Me? cut the cord, man. Cut the cord. Who's who's dropping off? F H N. F H N. Okay. Uh, what about you, Jakub? Who are, who's the four players you're leaving at home? Um. Well, the the, the first decision uh, is 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 clearly Mahmoud Tekdemir. Who I still don't get why yeah. he chose him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um. The second, I think that if you looked at it realistically, it probably should have been Mert, but he he mm. won't drop Mert because yeah. he's uh, you know a, a, a veteran and. Uh, and he was uh, he he was the keeper for the qualifier, so I don't think that will that will happen. So probably Gökhan, yeah. Gökhan Akkan. Yeah. Um, I think that Kerem Kerem Akturkolo will be dropped. I still don't hmm. think you know he, the guy has potential, but he he played like 900 minutes this year, hmm. so I don't think he's really ready for it. And um, you are so damn wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um. I don't know. I really don't know. I don't think. Um, I think that Halil Dervishole. Um, I like him, but it might be a little too early for him. But you know, I think it's between Halil and uh, and Efejan. So I don't really know. Right. I want. I want to say Halil because he's he's a little bit younger, and um, if he if he retains Abdul Kader Umur, they are kind of. Yeah. Okay. Halil Dervishol is maybe more of a striker, but uh, they are all they are both pacey, pacey players that can dribble the ball really close to the bodies. So maybe because of that, he will skip Dervishol and keep Abdul Kader Umur. But yeah, I think I think um, Gökhan Akkan, Mahmut Tekdemir, Efejan, and uh, and Kerem Aktürkol. Okay. Uh, for me, Mahmut for sure. Um... Gokan Akan, uh, yeah, it's I like Gokan, but it's the logical decision I think. Um, I do understand that Channel wants to give Mert his tournament, even though he won't be playing probably. Um, you know, you know Channel as well. Like he is very loyal to players that have done something for him in the past that have served him, and he will pay that, repay that loyalty for Mert. He was definitely not going to drop him. So uh, even if I was him, I wouldn't drop Mert either. I think at this stage, I maybe wouldn't have called him up in the first place, but he's called him up. So, you know, uh, I would drop Gokhan. I would drop Mahmoud Tegdimir for sure. Mahmoud Tegdimir for me, three years ago, maybe even four years ago, he was playing at a very high level, uh, given his limitations as a footballer. But the last two years, especially, I feel like he's been dropping off a lot. Like even last season when they won the league, he wasn't the starter. All the time anymore. Uh, I don't know why he's even on the national team. I, I don't think he was ever really a national team level player to begin with. Um, so I would definitely drop him as well. And uh, who are you going to use realistically? Efejan is he going to play at the Euros? I really don't think so. I think he has he has earned his call up over the last couple of years, and it's painful. But taking a player for the sake of taking him is not how a, a national team coach should be working. 
A national team coach has to take the players he will realistically use in a scenario. Like, let's say we get, I get a bunch of injuries. Who do you want to have? Do you want to have Kerem Aktukol on the bench? Do you want to have Halil, Halil uh, Agbunar on the bench? Do you want to have Efejan Karaja on the bench? Personally, I would prefer Halil Agbunar. I think he's going to be more useful in uh, those counter-attacking matches where you play against a t- stronger team, where you can utilize his speed and his uh, his quickness. Yesterday, Liverpool announced that they won't be continuing uh, Ozan. with Ozan Kabak. Yeah. He will be returning to Schalke, but like... Uh, you know, Schalke was uh, offering uh, any uh, another buyout close to Liverpool as uh, 18 millions uh, of pounds, I believe. Mm-hmm. But currently, if any other team uh, are to uh, like buy uh, Ozan Kabak, I think they will demand much more than them, much more than uh, 18. You think so? Yeah. Uh, why not? Like he has a uh, experience mm-hmm. as a Liverpool. Center back. Mm. Yeah, but still, and, I mean, Liverpool decided not to, uh, not to pay the money for him, right? Like, I think. Yeah, but like they, they, they like loaned him uh, in a like a tough yeah, stage, panic, like panic, where, yeah. yeah, panic. Well, not really panic, but they were they had a ridiculous amount of injuries. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You could even see like Jordan Henderson playing as a center back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I can't imagine that he will go to the second Bundesliga with Schalke. Like I would imagine that Schalke want to offload him and 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 reduce their wage bill. I, I'm not sure how much Ozan makes at Schalke. I don't think his wage is too high, probably. Um, but uh, yeah, it would make sense for um, for 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 him to join another Premier League team, perhaps. I mean, it's not like he was a was a flop or anything at Liverpool. I just think he's unlucky with. Uh, the players that, that that Liverpool already have, and uh, the, uh, of course, uh, players coming back like uh, Van Dijk coming back from injury, so uh, it's going to be difficult uh, for him to. Um, yeah, that, that was always going to be difficult for him, and maybe it's a, it's a blessing in disguise because with the players returning from injury at Liverpool, let's say they bought him permanently, uh, would he play a lot? Or would he just sit on the bench and uh, stagnate? Like I think it's a very important for Ozan right now to play, and he's maybe better off to go to a, a club like Leicester, for example, like like Chala did, and um, maybe play there for a season or two or three, and establish himself further, and then make that big move to a, to an elite club. Uh, like like I think Chala is uh, slowly uh, ready for that now. He's twenty five. I think uh, Chala could. Uh, could easily fit in at Manchester United. Like, for me, Chalar is a better player than uh, Harry Maguire, for example. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that'll do for this episode of uh, Football Al Turka. I'll uh, have uh, a lot of. I'll do some editing, but uh, maybe I'll leave the last part, the revelation. Maybe I'll leave that in so people understand why the sound wasn't the best today. Um, and then. Let's uh, let's let's meet up again in a couple uh, maybe next week or the week after or so, guys, and uh, let's do a preview for the Euros and maybe during the Euros we can do uh, a little bit of a more frequent and shorter episode to talk about the matches and hopefully a successful uh, Euro 2020. But uh, but quickly, I want to get your predictions. Like finally, just quick answer, rapid fire. What where do you think Turkey? What would you think Turkey will do at the Euros? How far will they get? Uh, Jakub, what do you think? Ooh, difficult. Um, I don't want. I don't want to make predictions, man. I I'm I'm not a predictions kind of guy. I always think that I'm not a guy that believes in potem, but kind of does. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I get it. Like you... I don't know. I I have. It's. I think it's either crash and burn. Yeah. Uh, so not even out of the group stages. That's gonna be really or... difficult though, because even if you finish third, you're probably true. Uh, but you know Turkey, we are we are the ones that always do the impossible. Yeah, that's true, that's true. Even if it's even if it's against our own uh, against our own uh, you know uh, progress. Um, I want to say uh, out of the group stages, like the last sixteen. Okay, what do you think, Umut? How far is Turkey getting in the in the Euros? Yeah, I w- I I think like we're gonna be getting out of the group, but I don't know about like what will happen next. Okay. I'm saying quarterfinals. Let's be optimistic. I think this is a great generation, and it's the end of a generation for some. Like this is 
probably the last chance for Burak to shine with, with the national team. Maybe he'll be there in 2022. But um, I think the season that he has had, he's ready for this. I think he wants to uh, fire on all cylinders one last time. And let's hope uh, that the, the Turkey do well on the, the Euro opener. They will, they will open the tournament against Italy. And that's the big game, right, in the group. Um, if Turkey can get a result against Italy, then they're basically got one leg in, in the next round already. Uh, it's going to be really difficult. Italy was uh, absolutely dominant during the qualification campaign. I think they got like, I think they got the maximum points. Um, but of course, Turkey have uh, shown against France and against the Netherlands that they uh, can do well against uh, top nations. So I have, uh, I have, I have, I have some high hopes, but I am also realistic. Like, like you guys, I mean, the thing is with Turkey, like we can do, we have the potential to do really well. But at the same time, Switzerland are a really tough team. Wales are not to be underestimated. We are not in an easy group. This isn't a group with, with any pushover nation. It's going to be difficult. Um, so, yeah, let's uh, hope for the best. And uh, I, I'm predicting a quarterfinal. But uh, let's get back to that in a couple of weeks. Thanks uh, a lot, guys, for joining me. And uh, thank you for listening. And we'll see you again next time.